I'm so, so pleased you've joined us and I'm really praying that this sermon that what I've prepared to share with us today is both encouraging and edifying for you, that it builds you up and it leads you closer to Jesus. Okay, so this morning we are week two in our series called The Kingdom of God. I spoke to us last week from Matthew 6, 33, where Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be given to you. And this morning we're going to continue that series and we are going to be looking at Acts chapter 10. Uh, verses 34 through to 38, and Becca Forsey, who's part of the team here, she's going to read it to us and then pray for us. Our verses today come from Acts 10, verses 34 through 38. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are with us. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus, that we may be with you for all eternity. Father, I pray for the message today. I pray that you would speak to each one of us through the message and that we would know that you are God and that you are with us. Amen. Thank you, Becca. Um, I, for those of you who know me, you know that we've got three kids at home. My wife, Amy, and I, uh, our boy's eight, we've got a daughter who's seven, and our youngest is just about to turn one. And in my years of parenting, I've learned, I've learned a lot of things, right? Mostly how not to do it, but um, I, I, one of the key things that I've learned is that children are serial imitators. They are serial imitators. Have you ever noticed that about kids? Um, it's like they're sponges and they soak up all of your bad habits, all of your actions, all of your words, all of your deeds, and then they just copy you all the time. And uh, for me, it's like they're like these little kids that are holding up mirrors to you, showing you all your faults and all your bad habits. Maybe it's just me. I, I don't know. Um, I'm sure that you guys don't have any bad habits that your kids copy. But for, for me, I've, 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 I've recognised that over the last eight years of being a dad. And um, one of my favourite all-time quotes is this. You teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. This quote of, of you teach what you know and you reproduce what you are is never truer than with kids. You teach what you know, but you reproduce what you are. And to be vulnerable this morning, I wanted to let you know some of my bad habits that my kids have picked up. And uh, the first thing, and, and you know, don't at me, I actually, I actually quite enjoy this. I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily call this a bad habit, but I understand it's not good etiquette. But once we've had a nice scrummy dinner together, my go-to is to lick my plate. Now, don't judge me, okay? If you've had a nice steak and chips or a baked potato or something that is juice and salty, salty goodness and, and it's on the plate, You've got to do something with it. You can't just wash it away. It'd be a crime against humanity. So I lick my plate and I'll never forget the first time I saw one of our kids do this. Picking their plate up at the table, licking clean their plate of all the juicy goodness that we had made them. The second bad habit that I have that my kids have picked up, and uh, I do apologise for this one, and this is toilet humour. I am terrible I, I'm just awful. Pray for me, right? When it comes to making jokes and having fun around toilet humour with my kids. Um, I don't know why. I just love it. I love help, helping make my kids laugh. And they find farting jokes really funny. I, I just want to say, I'm so sorry if my kids ever come to your house and make a, make a toilet humour joke. I, it's, it's, it's on me. Don't tell them off. Just tell me off. I'm so, so sorry. We're trying to help them understand that they need to keep those jokes to within the confines of our own family. The third thing that I've noticed recently that uh, we do, that, that we've reproduced in our kids, is their overreaction. So often something will happen at home, and it, it could be small, it could be big, but my, sometimes my reaction is to jump right up to 10 and say, what are you doing? Stop doing that. Tidy up. Da, 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 and to get really grumpy very, very quickly. And uh, that's, you know, a byproduct of being busy and tired and stressed and overworked and all those kind of things. But my kids do it as well. If... 
Uh, my daughter takes something from my son. He reacts like this up to 10 straight away. And, you know, it's only actually been over lockdown that Amy and I have realised, oh, they've got that from us. And so we're trying our hardest to kind of calm down, be a bit more gentle when we approach uh, conflicts or disagreements in our home. But this idea of kids imitating and being serial imitators, you know, you see it everywhere. Church children are serial imitators. And, you know, to have that kind of influence over someone is actually what leadership is. Leadership really is the ability to influence someone else. You know, you're only really a leader if you're influencing people. And as believers, it is our job and our duty to allow Jesus to have that kind of influence over our lives. In fact, it's what the Bible says. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.11, it says, be imitators of Jesus. And then in Galatians, uh, so, and then in Ephesians 5, again, Paul says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Church, here at Christ Central, we believe that Jesus is our leader. He's our king. And our lives should continually and gradually look more and more like his. That really is the essence of spiritual maturity. It's becoming... Uh, looking more and more like Jesus every day. Wendy Mann, who's a pastor, author and a friend of ours from the UK, she says this, the best way to know what the normal Christian life can look like is to look at how Jesus lived his life. And when we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus' major focus was on both proclaiming, that's preaching and teaching, and demonstrating, that's doing, the kingdom of God. Wherever he went, he did these two things, proclaimed the gospel, proclaimed the kingdom, and then demonstrated it. And you see, we're looking at this series at the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God was just so central to the life and ministry of Jesus. He told parables about it. He taught his disciples to pray for it. He uh, taught his people how to enter it. He, uh, he, he even told us to seek it before anything else, as we looked at last week week he demonstrated it over and over and over again Jesus brought the kingdom into the conversation and so this morning we're going to ask well what does that practically look like we learned last week yes we've got to seek it first okay but what does it look like to seek first the kingdom of God how did Jesus live what was the example that we should follow well one of the closest people to Jesus during his three years of ministry was the apostle Peter he was one of Jesus's closest friends And the verses we read this morning is Peter describing to uh, a crowd of Jews and Gentiles what Jesus was like. And in verse 38, he says these words. He said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Today I want to break down these verses because this snapshot, this, uh, this, this one verse is such an amazing uh, synopsis of the life of Jesus. And we just want to look at, well, how did Jesus live his life in order for us to be able to imitate him? And so the first thing that we see in this verse, the first thing that I wanted to highlight was this, that Jesus simply went around doing good. He went around doing good. So often we can think that in order to show someone the love of God or to bring the kingdom, we need to be able to perform some crazy miracle or have some prophetic word that speaks right to their heart. And there are definitely ways in which we can bring the kingdom of God. But actually Peter shows us that the, the bar for bringing the kingdom is a lot lower than we actually think. Wendy Mann again says this, we can often overcomplicate what it looks like to live like Jesus. The truth is that it starts simply by going around and doing good to people. That is the beginning of how we bring the kingdom of God. Do good. Be kind. Be nice. Love people. And the phrase uh, to do good, if you look at the Greek, it literally means to bestow benefits upon someone. It it means to, to give good things to enrich a person's life. Michael Frost, author of the book Surprise the World, talks about this as blessing people how he defines it is by adding strength to someone's arm he says it's to build them up and to fill them with encouragement and I love that picture of coming alongside someone and strengthening their arm as they're going about their day-to-day business there's so many ways church in which we can do good to people Uh, so many ways in which we can go and bless people just today tomorrow this week 
it's so easy for us to do. Things like smiling at someone is encouraging them, it's doing good. Something like saying good morning and being polite. Maybe sending an encouraging text to a friend. Maybe helping someone out with their groceries. Being kind, being generous, being loving. Paying for someone's coffee or lunch. I don't know if you've ever done that. You've been in the queue at the coffee shop and you, you pay an extra $10 and say to the barista, please buy the drink behind me. Or you're at a, a restaurant and you say you know, to, the, to the waiter, can you uh, pay for that family's lunch? This is all ways in which we can do good to people. Maybe we could take flowers to someone. Maybe someone who's overwhelmed or struggling. Maybe we could actually offer our, our services to a mum or a family who are overwhelmed and overworked. Maybe we just simply have people over for dinner a lot. And we just spend time listening to them. Listening is one of the best ways in which we can show the kingdom of God because it's doing good, it's strengthening, it's blessing them. Maybe we buy someone a gift card. This, the list is endless. We could just go on all day like this, talking about ways in which we can do good to people. But here's the key. Being intentional about this is so, so vital. You know, for me, when I, whenever I go out for a walk or coffee, uh, I have to get into an intentional mindset of saying I'm going to look for opportunities to bless people. Because for me, life is so busy. I, I often find that when I, as I say, when I go out for a, a coffee or for a walk, I'm often on my phone checking my emails, doing my to-do list, or I'm in my own little world thinking and praying about what I need in my life. And I need to get out of that bubble and be intentional, lift my head up and look around to see who's around me and how I can do good to those in my neighbourhood. Heidi Baker, who's a, a missionary out in Africa, doing just some incredible, incredible work. She has a motto, and her motto is this. Go low, go slow, and stop for the one. And what she means is by going low, she means be humble. Don't elevate yourself to a position of pride or superiority to those around you go low be humble and then then it says she says go slow don't rush through life you know as you're walking to the post office or or getting on the train for work don't be in a rush i know that's hard in new york city but try and get into the mindset of being intentionally going slow because often when we rush we can so easily miss what god's doing you know jesus's ministry was filled with moments and opportunities where he's 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 going from a to b and something along the way gets his attention. He's, he allowed God to interrupt him. And for us, when we're rushing around and busy, 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 we don't actually give God the opportunity to interrupt our lives. So slow down. Go low, go slow. And then finally she says, stop for the one. You know, we change the world actually by loving the person in front of us. It's not just the people at the so-called top who can change this world. Every single one of us can change this world by changing the life of another person. By simply doing good to them and loving them. Stop for the one. I just want you to imagine with me for a moment a community, a church family who did this. Can you imagine if each one of you watching this sermon right now decided to bless one person every single day for the next week, two weeks, month? Can you imagine the numbers of people all across Bay Ridge and South Brooklyn who would be impacted and blessed and transformed and who would encounter the love of God. There would be hundreds and hundreds of people if, if we just decided to be intentional about blessing one person every day. Church is doable. We can do it. This is what God has called us to be. And it's the kind of church that we want to be, where every single one of us has a role to play and we're living that out in our day-to-day -day lives. So first things first, in order to be a people who imitate Jesus and bring the kingdom of God into our lives, we simply need to be intentional about doing good. The second thing uh, that we see in these verses is that Jesus went around healing all who are under the power of the devil. Now church, the Bible says that there is a real enemy that is opposing God and Jesus. And in John 10, we learn that the enemy's mission is to kill, steal and destroy. It's, you know, impossible really to watch the news or read social media or to study human behavior or to look at our broken systems in our country and to not come away with the conclusion that something is wrong that there's evil and pain and brokenness in our world we talked about it last week how our world is fractured by sin and when you have a biblical worldview it makes sense the evil around us and and church this is exactly why 
we as a as a family as a community want to emphasize the need to bring the kingdom of god because our world needs an encounter with god and what peter teaches us here about the kingdom is that uh, for us to imitate jesus means actually to come with an appetite for the impossible an appetite for miracles and signs and wonders Wendy Mann, again, puts it like this. To follow Jesus means that we live with a conviction that there are no dead ends and no hopeless cases. No dead ends and no hopeless cases. That's what it means to live for Jesus. And miracles and the impossible can come in many different forms, can't they? I have prayed for people and they've been instantly healed. I've also prayed for people and actually their healings happened over uh, the next few hours or a week or a, uh, a month. There are different ways in which God can intervene and act and heal people physically. But he can also heal people emotionally or uh, uh, or mentally. A couple of weeks ago, Becca shared how actually she was depressed and anxious. God met her and totally freed her from that. And I know many, many stories where God has intervened, uh, interrupted people's lives and brought freedom from uh, emotional pain. And of course, we see people find freedom spiritually all the time. You know, we baptized Laurie just a couple of weeks ago. That is God bringing glory to spiritual free freedom and spiritual healing. And the amazing thing about God's kingdom is that it's not that he, he prioritizes one over the other. Actually, in God's kingdom, God wants every area of our lives to know freedom and healing. In fact, the Greek word used by Peter here in Acts 10 for healing means to make whole, to complete and actually, the, a common word used throughout the, the, the Bible for healing is the word sozo. And sozo literally means to uh, heal, restore, and save a person completely. It's the idea that it's talking about physical, spiritual, and emotional healing. God's desire is to make each one of us completely whole. Heal us in every area. He's interested in all of you, church. Your emotions, your physical needs, your spiritual needs. He's interested in it all. And the truth is that we all need God to continue to bring healing to us all the time. Whether it's spiritual healing, physical healing or emotional healing. And our jobs as followers of Jesus, our jobs to bring the kingdom of God. And the way we do that is to pray as often as we can for God's kingdom to, to break out. When something is broken, we should have the appetite to be praying for God to fix it. And that's the kind of church we want to be, Christ Central. We want to be, be a community where when someone is sick, we are laying hands on and praying. When someone has depression, we are seeking God for them and praying for freedom. And when people don't know Jesus or they're lost spiritually, we are asking God, come God, open their eyes to you. So I'm going to do something crazy now. Because uh, this was pre-recorded on Thursday. And you're probably watching on Sunday or maybe Monday or Tuesday next week. But I'm going to pray right now that wherever you are, God would heal you. And God's bigger than Zoom, he's bigger than YouTube, he's bigger than pre-recorded. So I'm going to trust that God is going to do a work right now. But if you have a need, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual, whether it's emotional, why don't you just put your hand on the part of body, or part of your body that makes most sense. So maybe you're depressed and you just need uh, God's peace. Why don't you put your hand on your heart? Maybe you're struggling with anxiety. Maybe you just put your hands on your head. Or maybe you actually have a physical injury, maybe your elbow, or your shoulder, wherever it is on your body. The Bible talks about laying hands on about the importance of touch and physical contact with the part of the body that needs healing. So wherever you are, if you need healing right now, this morning, it could just be peace in your heart. Lay your hands on and I'm just going to pray for us, all right? So do that now and let me pray. God, I thank you that you are sovereign and king over all things. I thank you that you are bigger than technology. You're bigger than time. And so I pray right now that for these dear people who are watching this video now, Lord God, who are putting their hands on areas of their body where they need healing, I just say, Holy Spirit, would you break out and bring freedom for for physical bodies where there's pain, where there's uh, twisted ankles or uh, slipped discs or bad shoulders or headaches or pain in any part of the body. Lord Jesus, I'm going to just pray for anyone with a liver condition who's struggling with, with uh, issues with their liver, anyone with hearing problems who is praying right now. We just say in Jesus' name, would you come and bring complete healing to those bodies right now. We pray for uh, anxiety and depression, anyone struggling with, with those or worry or fear, bring freedom. And I pray for any dear brothers and sisters, Lord God, who are watching and just saying, I'm spiritually lost. I say in Jesus' name, would you help them to be found this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
listen, if um, nothing's happened, there's nothing to stop you praying again. Okay, Jesus, he, there's a story in the Bible where he prayed for someone that had partial healing. He prayed again. You know, let's not give up. Let's persevere. But if you have experienced something, maybe you found something pop in your body or you found heat come across you or you suddenly felt peace, please let us know. If you're at House Church, talk to uh, the, the House Church leader or email us at hello at ChristCentral.nyc because we would love to celebrate with you and praise God and give him glory for what he's done. But I'm praying for God to continue to meet you where you're at. So firstly, to follow Jesus means that we are going to be intentional about doing good. Secondly, it means that we have an appetite for the impossible. And it's praying and asking God to break in in these impossible moments. The final thing that we see in verse 38 is that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and that God was with him. Church, I just want to say this. Jesus wasn't just a man. He was fully God, divine, divine in nature. The Bible makes that very clear. In fact, John 10, 30 is just one example. Philippians 2, another one. In fact, in Matthew 26, we see that Jesus was actually crucified. It was the reason he went to the cross because he made this claim of being equal with God. But he was also fully man. He was both fully God and fully man. And what that means is that Jesus uh, confined himself to the human body and he allowed himself to be limited to the flesh. The Bible makes it very clear through things like Philippians 2 and uh, in the Gospels where you know it just highlights his humanness, how Jesus got tired and he needed to rest and he needed to eat, even how he expressed his emotions and felt pain. And this actually is very good news for us, you see, because what it means is that if Jesus was fully God but yet limited himself to the human body, what it means is that, that his ministry that we are called to imitate is actually attainable. If he wasn't human in any form and he was just God, I can't attain to be God. But I can attain to be a human living in the power of God. And that's the example that Jesus set us. And that's what his whole ministry was about. It was about setting us an example as to what it means to be kingdom bringers. And he made it very clear that he wanted his disciples to follow in his footsteps. John 16, he says, but truly I tell you, it's good for that, that I go away. Because unless I go, I can't send you the spirit. And then in Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus said this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's a promise from Jesus. It says, You will receive power. There's power in God in the Spirit as he comes upon us. And Jesus was saying in these verses that actually post-cross, the Spirit of God is now available to every single person who believes in Jesus. Every single person who calls themselves a follower of Christ now has access to the power of God. And you know, this is God's growth strategy. God's growth strategy is not to appear on the clouds with angels and say, follow me. His growth strategy is you and me. To be people uh, who imitate Jesus, full of the Spirit, and bring the kingdom of God by doing good and healing all of those around us. You know, the word Christian literally means little Christ. That's our mission. It's to live like him. And, it, and, and in order to live like him, it means to be full of his spirit. And you know, whilst the Bible says that actually as believers, the spirit lives inside of you, it says that it, we also see in Ephesians, Paul says, go on being filled with the spirit. Showing us that, you know, encountering God is not just a one-time thing that we do, but should be part of our regular rhythms and daily routines. We should be praying for God to, God to fill us with his presence every single day. And what I love about verse 38 is that what we really see, what they, uh, it teaches us is that everything flowed from the fact that God was, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. The fact he was able to do good and bring healing was because he was full of the Holy Spirit. Just like a car needs gas in the tank in order to drive, so too we, church, need the Holy Spirit in order to function to our full potential. So in summary, to be a believer means to imitate Jesus. And to imitate Jesus means to live a life of the kingdom of God, bringing it from heaven to earth. And to be kingdom focused means this, to be intentional about doing good, to have an appetite for the impossible and to be praying daily for the spirit. And so to apply this word, I want to encourage us to do two things. And uh, the first thing I want you to encourage, and if you're at house church, your leaders can hand out pens or you can do this on your phone. But I want you to write down the, the, the names of three people in your life who you could bless this week. 
This is all part of being intentional. Three names. Write down three names. It could be a neighbour, a friend, a work colleague. Try and make at least one of them a non-believer. But write down three names of people you can bless. And, and let's begin the process of getting into a habit of doing good to people. And then I want you to write down next to each name that you've written down how you can bless them this week. And it might be, I'm going to send them encouraging texts. I'm going to take them coffee. I'm going to babysit their kids. I'm going to, whatever it might be. You know your friends. You know the people in your life better than I do. You need to write their name down and then write, how can you bless them this week? Let's be intentional about doing good this week, church. If you uh, feel up for it, you could actually make this a Sunday habit. That every Sunday night you write down three names of people you want to bless and how you're going to do them, uh, bless them this week. The second thing I want you to do though is I want you to encourage you to take five minutes every morning to ask God to fill you with his spirit. You could do it whilst brushing your teeth or whilst in the shower or whilst making your morning coffee. Find a time where you do something every day where you can just stop and ask God to fill, him, fill you with his spirit. You know, maybe use Acts 1 as a prayer back to God. Say, Jesus, you promised me power. You promised me the Holy Spirit. Come and fill me. There was no if the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus, you said when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There's a certainty to him giving you his spirit. Maybe use that as a prayer back to him. Church, thank you. Bless you. Have an amazing week. Thanks, guys.